Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, promised by God in Scriptures. That might seem obvious to us today because we're we're Christians and we live in a, a society where Christianity has been dominant for the last 1,500 plus years. We take for granted that Jesus is Jesus Christ, that he's the anointed one of God, that he's the righteous one, that he's David's branch. These things are often assumed in churches, taken for granted, as I said before. And so because Christianity has had this dominant privilege, you might say, for the last 1,700 years in the West, we we can fail to appreciate the audacity of the claims. Now, audacious or not, they're true. And the truthfulness of it has been testified to generation after generation for two millennia. That's why it matters. So, is Jesus of Nazareth the Christ of God? or not in the apostolic age in the days of the early church in the in the years right after Jesus was raised from the dead it was much more controversial the church was in its infancy it had barely become visible Pentecost had just happened <clears throat> and so there was a lot more at stake they didn't have a thousand years or two thousand years of apostolic doctrine of Christian interpretation there, there was no tradition of Christian interpretation in this way and the Jews at that time had this tradition of interpretation from Abraham and from Moses down into the present of that generation So, this is what the apostles, this is what Jesus himself and the apostles are interacting with in the Gospels and in the epistles. They're interacting with the reality that Jesus is somewhat novel. Jesus is new. Now, obviously, God had promised through the prophets a new covenant, that there would be a time of reformation in the worship when the promises God made to the fathers would be fulfilled and the Gentiles would be grafted into the, the Abrahamic promise and he would be the father of many nations. But yet it was still controversial. So I'm not at all suggesting that Jesus isn't the Christ or that the apostolic claims are dubious. To the contrary, I affirm them and uphold them. But I can sympathize with first century Jews and Gentiles who had an awareness of the law of God that the apostles' doctrine could seem strange. And so what you see, the burden, the burden of the apostles in the book of Acts, for example, when they're preaching and teaching about Jesus, the burden is to defend his identity. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The burden is to demonstrate that this Jesus, whom you crucified, God has made both Lord, God has made him Lord. And so, you, you feel that tension. But what's so interesting is that because we assume Jesus is the Christ and we ride on 2,000 years of tradition and interpretation, we can begin, but because it's assumed, because it's taken for granted, we, we fail to see the problem oftentimes with certain ways of interpretation that kind of creep back in. So I would contend that there's a lot of modern ways of reading the Bible, especially the Old Testament, uh, 
that are unfaithful readings of the scriptures according to apostolic doctrine. Right? Jesus himself told the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which bear witness to me, and you will not come to me that you may have life. So, what I, what I perceive is that in the church today, there's a lot of people who still kind of reside inside the Christian house, and they still have the, they still affirm the creedal structure, but they're at some level denying the foundations of the structure. What I mean by that is they're they're reading the Old Testament in a way that violates the apostolic preaching. And they it's subtle a lot of times, and people don't realize it, but we end up with these things that are intention. We're, we're affirming, well, yes, of course, Jesus is, is Jesus Christ. We, we believe. He's died for our sins. We, we trust him for forgiveness. He's... Through him, we have resurrection and hope for the life to come. And yet, we allow ourselves to entertain ideas and interpretation, hermeneutics, ways of reading scripture that violate the very foundations of these creedal structures in the church. And so one of my passions is to help people rediscover the apostolic foundations of the Christian faith. How should we read the Bible, especially the Old Testament? See, ideas have consequences. And when you begin to introduce alien hermeneutics and alien ideologies into the church, it will bear bad fruit. And if the foundations are taken away, the house is going to crumble. So even though people may be defending certain central truth claims of Christianity and affirming them by they're undermining those by allowing there to be cracks in the foundation but if we go back and look at the foundations again what are the apostles doing well they're doing what Jesus did so I want to start in Luke 24 with Jesus he's on the road to Emmaus these two people, these two disciples are walking to Emmaus. They're sad. It's literally like right after Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday. Jesus has just died, just been raised. They don't know Jesus has been raised yet. And they're downcast. And Jesus meets them on the way, but they don't recognize him for who he is. And he talks with them. And he asks them what's going on, and they're like, are you the only person that doesn't know? And they tell him about Jesus and how Jesus died. And they thought Jesus was the Christ. But as I've said in other videos, the Jews had skewed and misplaced hope. Skewed messianic expectations and misplaced hope. So we thought he was going to be the one God had promised us. Okay, And Jesus said, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? In beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So he's like, oh, you foolish and slow of heart to believe. All the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for Christ to suffer and then enter into his glory? And then he goes back to the scriptures and he explains everything concerning himself. So the, the cornerstone of apostolic preaching is that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the promised one, the anointed one. The righteous one. And according to the apostles, according to Jesus here himself, the burden of the Old Testament is to demonstrate, to foretell 
the sufferings of Christ and his subsequent glory. Was it not necessary for Christ to die and then to be raised? Okay, a short time later, so they, they recognize Jesus after he stops and he pretends he's, he's like, oh, I think I'll keep going. They're like, no, no, stay with us. He comes in. They sit down to a meal. Jesus breaks the bread. Their eyes are open. They recognize him for who he is, and Jesus disappears. They rush, they rush all the way back to Jerusalem and say, we've seen the Lord. He's alive. Okay, and they're talking about these things, and then Jesus comes back and appears among them. And they're afraid, and they're like, is this a ghost? And he's like, hey, it's okay. It's me. I'm not a ghost. I have a real body. Do you have anything to eat? Okay, and they, they gave him a piece of fish. He took it, and he ate it. Okay, so Jesus said, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are the witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. So he un opens their minds to understand the scriptures. Christ should suffer and be raised again. So we see this pattern. The scriptures are all about Jesus. They're foretelling his suffering and his subsequent glory. They're telling about his death and his resurrection about the forgiveness of sins for all nations. When we get into the book of Acts, we see, for example, um, I had it here real quick. So in Acts chapter 8, Philip preaches to Samaria, they believe. He comes in the spirit to this chariot where there's a, the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch is reading Isaiah, what we call Isaiah 53. He reads about, um, he's reading about Jesus. And he says, the eunuch says to Philip, about whom, I ask, does the prophet say this, about himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told them the good news about Jesus. And as they were coming along the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? So they stopped the chariot. They both went down to the water, and he baptized him. So the eunuch's reading Isaiah's prophecy about the suffering servant, and he's confused. God brings him Philip. Philip's like, he's like, Philip, I don't understand. Is, is the prophet speaking about himself or somebody else? Philip's like, I'm going to start starting with this scripture. He told him the good news about Jesus. So Philip proclaimed Christ to the eunuch from Isaiah. Saul of Tarsus was a Pharisee who violently persecuted the way. He rejected the way. He he sought to get them to blaspheme, and he he in cases where they're going to be put to death, he voted yes. <laughs> he hated Christ. He hated the way. He thought it was blasphemous fables and a perversion of the faith of Abraham. Of the, of the, it, what he did not see apostolic doctrine as a faithful reading of the Old Testament. And he thought that the Jesus followers were evil, perverse people who needed to be killed. He received letters from the chief priests to go to Damascus. So he wasn't even content to just persecute him in, in Judea. He wanted to go to Syria. He wanted to go and follow them. He was so, so zealous to stamp out this false religion in his mind that he, went, he was willing to go to a far city to imprison Christians, and he wanted to bring them back to Jerusalem bound, and he wanted to have them put to death. But as he was going to Damascus, he saw a bright light, and the ascended Christ appeared to Saul and spoke with him on the way. And Saul 
was blinded by the light. He had something like scales on his eyes and he was dumbfounded. He went into Damascus and he sat in his darkness for like three days, no food or water, astonished at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then God brought him Ananias, a brother in the Lord, from the church in Damascus. And he laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. Something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. And he went down and was baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. For some days he was with the disciples in Damascus. Okay, so Saul has seen the Lord. He's had three days to sit in astonished silence, neither eating or drinking. God brings him in and eyes. He restores his sight. He gets baptized. He eats some food. He's strengthened. And he stays in Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, Jesus is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. So Saul sees Jesus, meets Jesus, Jesus speaks to him, he's converted and he immediately goes and begins to prove to the Jews in Damascus that Jesus is the Christ. And of course, that stirs up controversy and he has to be led out through the city in a basket. But we see this consistent theme. Jesus himself teaches us in the Gospels that the scriptures, the Old Testament, speak of him, of Jesus Christ. They foretell his virgin birth. They foretell his death, his descent. They foretell his resurrection from the dead. They foretell his ascension. They foretell that he is going to be a light to the Gentiles. In him, the Gentiles will hope. This is the burden of apostolic preaching, to demonstrate and prove that Jesus is the Christ, the awaited one, the anointed one. This is who we are looking for. In him, the fullness of God dwells bodily. So the mystery of the person of Christ, the identity of Christ, this is the burden of apostolic preaching. And this gospel, this good news of Jesus, is proclaimed from the Old Testament scriptures. So apostolic preaching is the proclamation of Jesus from the Old Testament. We get that from Jesus himself. We get that from the apostles. Philip does that with the eunuch. He proclaims Jesus from Isaiah. Paul is proving to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. When we get to um, Acts 19, for example, um, Apollos leaves Ephesus, goes to Achaia, which is where Corinth is. So most likely he was in with the Corinthians. And Where is it here? Okay, so it's it's the very end of chapter 18. Apollos goes to Achaia, and the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome, welcome him. And when Apollos arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. So Apollos is greatly helping the ones who have come to faith in Christ in Corinth because Judaizers were speaking against the way. People had believed on Christ, had received the forgiveness of sins, had received eternal life, but false teachers, these Judaizers, were saying, no, Jesus isn't the Christ. But Apollos comes and strengthens them and, and refutes, powerfully refuted the Jews in public. So he's willing, he's speaking in the synagogue and he's going to the scriptures, showing from the scriptures that the Christ is Jesus. 
So again, this is the burden. So when you're reading the epistles, when you're reading Acts, what, how, the way they preach, Stephen standing before the Sanhedrin, Peter on the day of Pentecost, Paul's, Paul's sermon <clears throat> in uh, Acts 13. He, he has this long thing, but he says, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. So Paul's consistently proclaiming the death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, the descent of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and the forgiveness of sins. So Everything that we kind of see encapsulated in the Apostles' Creed, the creation of the world by God, the virgin birth, the death and suffering of Christ, the subsequent glory, the forgiveness of sins. These are the things that the, the Apostles are proclaiming in Jesus' name from the Old Testament Scriptures. So Christianity, the Christian faith, is a way of reading the Old Testament Christologically. Now, Christianity is not merely a hermeneutic. It's not merely a, some kind of philosophy or theology. It is first and foremost the revelation of God in Christ and the historical facts, objective historical facts of what Jesus Christ did in history. But the historical objective reality of Jesus is rooted in this hermeneutic, this theology of the Old Testament. So the whole Bible is a Jesus book. And the objective truth, the historical facts, are embedded in this theological narrative, this historical redemptive, redemptive historical drama that provides the context and the meaning for the historical events. So the, the truth and the history and the theology and the doctrine, they're all woven together. The theology is embedded in the history, but the history is embedded in the theology. And you can't undo that. If you begin to deny parts of the historical reality, you begin, you undermine the doctrine. But also, if you start to undermine the doctrine, you cast shadows or doubts onto the historical reality. You, you start to remove the meaning. And so we need the apostles to guide us through the Old Testament to see that Jesus is the Christ. And they're doing that in the same way that Jesus did. So if you're reading the Old Testament as primarily about something other than Jesus, then you're not reading the Old Testament Christianly. If you're reading the Old Testament as not primarily about Jesus, then you're, you're, you're missing the mystery Jesus himself says that the primary burden of the Old Testament is the suffering of Christ and his subsequent glory. And this is what we see with the apostolic preaching. When they prove from the scriptures Jesus is the Christ. That the scriptures are talking about death, burial, resurrection. Peter himself says that the spirit of the prophets, right, they were wondering if they were ministering to themselves. And Peter says, no, they're ministering to you when they foretold beforehand the sufferings of Christ and his subsequent glories. So again, the foundation of the Christian church is the apostolic doctrine surrounding the person and work of Christ. And the Old Testament narrative is the his redemptive historical backdrop 
in which to understand Christ. And so what do we see when we look at the Old Testament? Well, we see that the righteous will live by faith. That the, the righteous who live by faith are blessed with Abraham, the man of faith. We see that out of the stump of Jesse, a shoot will come out. We see that that shoot will become a righteous branch, and in him the Gentiles will trust. We see that the tabernacle of David will be raised up or rebuilt in Amos. Well, what is that? That's the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We see in Psalm 2, right? How, how do they interpret Psalm 2? I think it's Acts 4. They say that Herod and the Gentiles have gathered together against the anointed one. So they, they interpret the Psalms Christologically and they apply it to their present context. So all throughout the scriptures, right? Amos 9 is not about uh, reconstructing the tabernacle of David as a house of prayer in 2020. Amos 9 is about the resurrection of Christ, the body of Christ from the dead. And all the Gentiles will hope in him. And so at the Jerusalem Council, when Peter recounts how the Spirit came to the Gentiles when he preached to Cornelius, and the Spirit came to them just like it did to the Jews at Pentecost, and Paul and Barnabas testify about how what they've experienced on their missionary endeavors and how the Gentiles are believing and the church of Antioch is thriving. And then James, the bishop of Jerusalem, given place of deference and honor at the council, he kind of gives the final word and he just says, look, to this the prophets agree. For it's written, at that time I will rebuild or raise up the tabernacle of David and the Gentiles will trust in him, hope in him. So what we see is that the church is this eschatological Israel, the church is this new covenant community of Abraham, is the new covenant community of Abraham that is fulfilling the promise God made to the fathers in Jesus. And through Christ, Gentiles are brought to faith and repentance and Gentiles receive the blessing of Abraham through Christ and become heirs of the, of the world. So this apostolic preaching is at the is the cornerstone, right? It's the foundation of apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone. And we're being built as living stones into a holy temple for God's praise. But so all that to say, one of my passions, again, is to help people rediscover the apostolic preaching to say, I want to. I want to search the Old Testament scriptures with the apostles as my guide. The Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica, for they searched the scriptures to see if what the apostles said were true. So we want to read the Bible with an eye towards Christ. What does this passage tell me about Jesus? And I'm not saying you should just jump into the Old Testament and start making stuff up. Jesus said the Old Testament's about him. The apostles demonstrated. So the best way to understand the Old Testament scriptures, Christologically, is to read the New Testament and pay attention to how Matthew and Mark, Luke and John, and Paul and Peter and Stephen and James and the others are utilizing the Old Testament in their teaching. Pay attention to the song of, of, of Simeon. Pay attention to the song of Zechariah and Mary's song. To how, how they sing about what's going on with the advent of Christ. And what you begin to see is that Jesus is the Christ, or as it says in 
Acts 9, that the Christ is Jesus. So Christianity rises or falls on the incarnate, resurrected Jesus of Nazareth, attested to by the Old Testament scriptures and borne witness to by the apostles, and that the apostles and prophets are that foundation of our faith with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone. And so I would just encourage you to familiarize yourself with the foundations of your faith and be leery of teaching that undermines that, that's contrary to that, that would undermine your confidence in who Jesus is in his person and work. If you're looking for another resource, I highly encourage the demonstration of apostolic preaching by St. Irenaeus of Lyon in the second century. Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John. And in the demonstration of apostolic preaching, he just works his way through the redemptive historical drama that's laid out in scriptures from Adam to Abraham to Moses to David to Christ, and then looks at many scriptures of the Old Testament. He's, he's explaining the apostles' doctrine with great detail, and it's really, really helpful. And it sounds a lot like the sermons and such that you see in Acts, because Irenaeus is a close descendant of the apostles defending the faith against heresies and just simply summarizing, saying this is a faithful summary of what we understand, that Jesus of Nazareth is the long-awaited Christ God promised through the Old Testament. And he is the one we are waiting for, and the Gentiles are turning to him because he is a light to lighten the Gentiles. And he is that light, and we are finding hope and forgiveness of sins in him. And so... I would say read your script, read your Bible, especially the book of Acts, especially paying attention to how Jesus is being presented and how the scriptures are being used to bear witness to Christ. And then read the epistles in light of that. Read Jesus, read the gospels. And like I said, get a copy of Irenaeus' demonstration on apostolic preaching. It's not that expensive. It's easy to get to on Amazon, and it's extremely helpful. So we don't need to settle for bad ways of reading the Bible. We can recover this rich apostolic heritage that we have and read the Bible with Christian eyes and see Jesus. Um, an, a contemporary author that I would highly recommend would be Chad Bird. He has the book, The Christ Key. Uh, you can find Chad online. He has lots of resources. Um, he's connected with 1517, a great Lutheran uh, online presence ministry. So Chad has just so many resources. There's a wealth of Old Testament scholarship all about Jesus Chad is just so faithful to the apostolic witness of who Jesus is, and he will help you read the Old Testament according to the apostolic preaching. He's like a modern-day Irenaeus who can guide you through the scriptures. So if you've been malformed and misshapen by modern ways of reading the Bible that damage the foundations of your faith, highly encourage you to do that remedial work and really begin to dig into how should I understand the scriptures to be about Jesus. The scriptures are about Jesus, and we want to read them that way because that is the true and faithful way of reading the scriptures, and that's how our faith is going to be built up. We need Apollos and Paul and Peter and these men to refute the Jews publicly, to refute Judaizing tendencies, to refute liberalism and critical theory and uh, dispensationalism and all these things that want to undermine apostolic teaching and preaching and recover a faithful reading of Scripture that all points to and is rooted in the revelation of God and Jesus Christ.
So hope that encourages you. But it's my prayer that people would be set free to rest in and rejoice in Christ and that we would have a new generation of people who defend from Scripture that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. Amen.